Let's talk a little bit about Italian wines. Uh, we are in perfect position here because we have a Prosecco that we could uh, have our, enjoy our toast with. But Italy is a wonderful place to look for wines. It may not be as well known as to most people as France, but in Italy, winemaking started thousands of years ago with the Phoenicians. The Greeks were the sort of follow-up back to that. And then when the Romans came along, they export winemaking all around their, their empire, which meant all across Europe. You can visit places in, in Europe where you can see where Roman winemaking was taking place 2000 years ago. Don and I were in a Roman cellar in Vahau in the Vahau region in Austria on the Danube, where the, the barrels are literally in a 2000 year old room and every wall of the winery was built, has some Roman building in it. They haven't all survived intact and they've had to be repaired, but it's, um, it's just a very special tradition. Now, as a result of all of those different contributions, there are over 2000 wine grapes in Italy. I think if, if, if we asked you to name grapes, maybe you could come up with eight or 10, but think of 2000 and trying to learn all of those. And somewhere between 350 and 400 of them are in active production. So there's just a wealth of new opportunities and a lot of really interesting wines. They don't, they grow some of the international grapes that we know of from France, for example, like Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or Chardonnay. But the real treasures of Italy are their indigenous grapes. So let's start with our Prosecco. Hopefully you've already opened it up. <laughs> Uh, this is the most widely sold sparkling wine in the United States. Lamarca, there's more Lamarca Prosecco sold than there is all champagne together. And I think there's a really good reason for that. Does everybody like this wine? Do you have it open? What do you think? Yes. I love Lamarca and I have since probably five or six years ago. <laughs> So I think that it's it's really fresh, it's pretty, it's made in a different way than champagne. Anybody have any thoughts about what makes it different from champagne for them who might prefer it to champagne? It, it's not a natural bubble. What, is the, the bubble come naturally or is it infused? Oh no, I'll explain how the bubbles. So here's what happens. When you make a sparkling wine, the first thing you do is make a still wine in the normal way, you ferment it. And when the fermentation finishes, you have a wine ready to bottle, maybe after some aging. When you make a sparkling wine, you take that still wine, you put it back into the fermentation vessel, if it isn't there already, more yeast, and then some more sugar because it's already fermented out the first time. You cover up the, you cover it up. And any chemists here know what happens in fermentation? What's a byproduct of fermentation as, as the alcohol, as the sugars converted to alcohol? Carbon, carbon dioxide carbon in your dioxide. little thing. <laughs> yes, carbon dioxide. So about half of what comes out of that fermentation is carbon dioxide. When you cover the vessel, like the tank in the case of Prosecco, you capture it. So that part is fairly similar between champagne and between Prosecco. The difference is that champagne is then normally put into the bottle, it will be sold in, and it's aged on what we call the lees, which are the yeast cells that have done their job. And that changes the flavor, it adds new flavors to champagne. Uh, it, they will still, the champagne may still have some fresh fruity flavors, but it's often dominated by those flavors of aging. The Prosecco doesn't age, maybe a, little, a few months, but it's bottled right away for immediate drinking. And the flavors are fresh, fruity flavors of the glare. A different process, and it gives you different style of wine. Okay. Okay. Now, this grape is actually was called Prosecco until early in the 20th century, when Italy decided it wanted to protect the name and reputation of Prosecco, and they changed the name of the grape to Glero. But you could go to Australia and you could buy made from the grape Prosecco cuttings from the same grapes that are being grown in the northeast of Italy now. 
Uh, however, I think they've done a great job of branding themselves, making a reputation for themselves. And this particular one is really typical. It's a little bit off dry. Does anybody taste just a hint of sweetness in this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So they, 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 what, what's called residual sugar. They don't ferment all the sugar out. So that gives it a little hint of sweetness. And that's actually why it will help cocktail. Did anyone have the chance to make the limoncello cocktail? No, but I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have two bottles, so you can save the second one for that. You just stir a little limoncello in and you mix in a raspberry and a mint leaf and you have a really delicious cocktail. Um, and if you live on Hilton Head and you have a lemon tree, you could make some limoncello of your own. I have a lemon tree. Okay, <laughs> you'd only need 10 lemons, 10 okay. nice juicy ten, lemons. Ten. And you can you can get an, a whole batch out of that. The recipes, uh, I gave you a recipe. It's yeah. not, the worst part is peeling the lemons because you have to use the lemon peels. Uh, but with <laughs> 10 lemons, I think we could probably mostly manage that, okay. Um, any questions about Prosecco or sparkling wine or, or um, anything else, actually, while we're thinking about it? Did anyone try the, the food with it, the almonds? Yes. Oh, yes. Very, yes. Good. yes. Very good. Very good. I like some of the cheese and some shrimp. Shrimp. So, <laughs> you, you, I didn't know that was on the menu. <laughs> Don and I sacrificed ourselves for quite a while tasting different foods with these to the almonds i don't even remember what did we taste on 20 cheeses at least oh, oh my gosh <laughs> right? and we don't even normally eat cheese but we, we're trying to find some things that would go with with your food tonight um oh. and we ended up with a couple of nice italian cheeses we did well <laughs> so good. well we it, you know it's one of those things you just have to do what you can right do what's necessary um where did you go, where did you sacrifice what? Yeah, Thank yeah. you for your sacrifice so that oh, we you're can welcome. enjoy ourselves so fully. <laughs> yeah. So we thought the Robiola Bacina, that we'd never tasted that before. The Robiola, excuse me. And um, I, I thought that was fabulous with all three of these wines. You can see as you go through, but it was a new discovery for us. <clears throat> Any questions about Prosecco, like what it is, when to drink it, the region, and Anything? You have a nice handout too, if everyone sees that. Yeah, that was very, very informational, <laughs> whatever. Well, you don't have to take any notes unless you, you hear something that isn't in there. But- um, Lisa, the, the grapes that are mentioned here, the Gar Garganega and the Trebbiano de Suave, what, uh -huh. what would those be used for besides Prosecco? Oh, well, those are actually, um, they could probably use for a variety of things, but those are for the suave. So if you turn back to a page, the Glera, I don't know of any Glera still wines. There's just in February, a Rosé Prosecco was authorized and it uses a combination of Pinot Noir and, and Glera. So that's another wine style that's being made with this grape and it's brand new. Lisa, Lisa, I have a question. Um, oftentimes, we think of hillsides with grapevines. Um, are the conditions for the grapes that we're talking about now hillsides and grapevines, or are they on a flat ground? One's on Mount. Um... Yeah, this is a really excellent question. For the most part, Europe has a fairly cool climate, although when you go so in southern Italy, it can get very warm. But the reason there's an expression that Bacchus loves the hills, the reason for that is when you're in a cooler climate, if, if you grow grapes on it, usually in the middle part of the hill, especially if they face the south or the southeast, they get the best sun for ripening. All if you get a frost or if it's cold at night, the cold air rolls right past them from the top of the hill down to the bottom. So the hillsides can be a really good place for those reasons. Another thing about wine grapes, is that you don't actually want them to get really rich soil because if they do, they'll grow too many leaves and they won't ripen the grapes with all the full flavors that you'd like to have. So if you're in the middle of a hill, what's happening? A lot of the dirt and the nutrients are washing downhill. If you're at the top, maybe too much is washed off. So it's the Goldilocks section where the soil isn't very rich, 
and it's warm enough and there's enough sunlight. Uh, now, having said all of that, if any of you have ever visited Bordeaux, you notice that it's flat um, yes. or big parts That's of California. Yeah, yeah but, exactly. But in this case, what we call, you know, the better regions for the, for the Prosecco grapes, and this is true for the other two wines we're tasting, those are grown on hills and they're facing in such a way that they're getting the sun in the right way. And in the case of the really Southern one in Sicily, it's actually the, the higher they go, the cooler it gets, which is a good thing, warm for the grapes there. I actually do have a question. There sure. One, I went to, my husband and I went to like, to Le Cirque and we ordered a bottle of wine and the sommelier there told us this little anecdote about the three hills in Italy and like there's a certain type of grape that grows on one on half of the hills and there's a certain type of grape that grows on the other half of the hills and I guess I'm wondering if that's something that you've heard of or if it's true because I wasn't sure if it was just like a selling point for him or if it's <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember which wine you were drinking <sighs> I want to say Valpolicella but I'm not 100 percent sure so what he's probably thinking about is that different al altitudes, for example, make a big difference. Remember, we talked about where it's, it's really hot in Sicily. If they grow the grapes higher up, then they have better growing conditions and they can ripen fully. Um, some grapes ripen really fast. So, for example, if you are in the Piedmont, the Barbera grows at the bottom of the hill where it doesn't get as much light and it's not as warm because it's a fast ripener and it doesn't need it. So depending on where you are in the hill and the grapes growing cycle and whether you want it to take its time and let lots of flavors develop, it, it's actually really important. And different parts of the hill are better for different grapes or for different quality grapes. Okay. So it was just interesting because he was telling us about like how two families, each one family owned this type of grape and one family owned this type of grape, but they were almost on the same hills and they were kind of rivals. It was funny. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions about the Prosecco wine in general? I did a tasting for the graduate alumni. They wanted to know how to savor a bottle of wine. They were just um, ready to, to uh, ask all kinds of things. And Don had to go into the closet and find our savor. So. Lisa, how cold should you serve Prosecco? I'm sorry, what? How cold should you serve this? I think you want it to be nice and cold. I'd put this one in the refrigerator for a couple hours, ideally, before you serve it. Um, did you try that? Or what you do know, other people Chris, think? Christy has it here with ice in it. Well, there's one she way to keep it cold. With ice. <laughs> Does it taste right to you that way? Do you like it's it? It's perfect. Okay. Well, then that's how cold to serve it. For me, that's right. Okay. okay. Lisa. Um, uh, Prosecco is um, quite in now, isn't it? Has it displaced other champagnes in its popularity? I think it has. Um, and one of the ways that Don and I have noticed this, if we try to buy a bottle of champagne, it often tastes like it's a little too old. And we, we had to take a test on Fortify, on next wines. And we, the night before we were in New York, we went into a very large well-known wine store and we bought several back. We thought, oh, we'll just get really tuned up for tomorrow. And every one of them was too old. Um, but I doubt that the Prosecco was suffering from that problem. Right. <laughs> Even in France, the amount of Prosecco being sold has gone up so dramatically that champagne sales have dropped quite a bit. So oh. this is the sparkling wine people are really enjoying right now. Good. Lisa, um, you mentioned champagne being too old what does old champagne taste like in comparison to the right age champagne it probably tastes a little bit like sherry it gets oxidized oh, well, okay. Okay. and it gets an right. acid acetaldehyde is actually that flavor if you've ever had a glass of sherry um it has sure. this flavor sure. that's the chemical acetaldehyde so okay. instead of yeah. tasting a little bready like from the yeast and a little bit like fruit for example, if there's a lot of Chardonnay, it will taste maybe like green apples. Or if there's a lot of red grapes, you might taste a little bit of red fruit. But instead, it will be dominated by these ox. And the color will change. Yeah. Flavors mm -hmm. and it will okay. get too gold yeah, looking. Yellower. Uh, Lisa, I was... And if you... Sorry. No, go ahead. 
Um, I was thinking that maybe Prosecco is more popular because it's less expensive. You know, that's a really important point. <laughs> Champagne has done a great job of trying to sell the wine in the U.S. at about $40 for an entry price. Whereas mm -hmm. this, this Prosecco is a fraction of that. So you can have long bottles of Prosecco amount of Champagne. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, how would you uh, compare the California sparkling wines with uh, Prosecco and Champagne? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, Probably, if you try one of the California sparkling wines, and I'll give you a couple examples in a second, you might taste that the that they're a little riper tasting. The alcohol levels might be a little higher. The Champagne region is one of the farthest north in France, the farthest actually north of most grape growing regions, and the grapes barely get ripe there. And so one of the reasons that they do the aging is to add flavors because the grapes are pretty neutral tasting. Now, if you go to California, Sonoma Valley or Anderson Valley, there's a, a lot of sparkling ripe there, maybe a little bit in Napa, and those grapes ripen, so they're going to have more flavor. Um, we've tasted a lot of the sparkling wines. I think the Rotor Estate is so delicious, it would be hard to, and, and also yeah, made it such a great style, it would be hard to tell that from Champagne. Um, we actually met the, the man who represents Rotor in this country, and he said sometimes they take the vintage Rotor estate and the vintage Rotorer from Champagne, and they serve the them Rotary. side by side, and they can't tell yeah. them apart. But of course, the Rotor estate is again a fraction of the price. Last time I looked, the, mm -hmm. the basic non vintage was around $23, $24. And the most basic rotor champagne is probably at least $40 non vintage mm. in this country. Mm. And the vintage prices go up, of course. Mm. That's, that was my, my recommendation that it's made in, in, um, in Mendocino, which is a great, cool climate. So the grapes don't get too ripe. And it, it's, they do a fabulous job. How do you spell that? R O E D E R E R, and then look for the word estate afterwards and look for the non vintage. Okay, thank you. Don, you start to say something. Uh, just a couple of quick things. The rotor people make Cristal. So if, if you remember, that was. Um, a big hit with a lot of the pop stars for a while. So they, they, they can make very expensive wines as well. David asked about what does old champagne taste like? And Lisa and I went to a old champagne tasting in London and tasted champagne after champagne. Uh, and these were 25 years old, 30 years old. And every one tasted like a favorite English food called Marmite. And if you've ever had Marmite, yes, we have. you won't forget it. Uh, and, uh, and they grew up on that. And I think when, they, when they're drinking their really old <laughs> champagnes, it reminds them of the happy times of growing up eating Marmite. Because what happens, as Lisa says, is that Marmite, is that the champagne is dominated as it gets older by these, these yeast cells that are in it that, that have died. And uh, in fact, Marmite is made from dead yeast cells. So it is very much the same flavor. So you can buy it in, in the Publix and Hilton Head. So you sometimes get an old bottle of champagne and a, and a jar of Marmite and see which one you can get down. <laughs> Better than haggis. Don, I've got the answer, thank you. <laughs> any more questions before we move on don did bring me the saber i don't know if everybody yeah. did it right in front so this okay. is what napoleon's can everybody see this i'll try to run it in front of the mm -hmm. the picture yeah. and here's the handle so napoleon's cavalry officers used to use their sabers to open their bottles of champagne. They were not drinking Prosecco. What you do with this, and I'm not gonna recommend you try it at home without a lesson or two. You get a very, very cold bottle. 
and you find the seam on the side of your sparkling wine bottle, which our, our little junior one doesn't have. And you just run in a very firm way. You run it up the seam until it hits the cork and the rim under it. And it should pop the top off. Do it outside. Don't point it at anybody. <laughs> and maybe take a lesson first. Um, but that actually reminded me, I was going to talk briefly about opening. Did anybody want to hear a little bit about safely opening a bottle of sparkling wine? Yep. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So what happens when you capture all that carbon dioxide in the bottle? Pressure. Pressure. Yeah. Pressure. Uh, in a bottle of champagne, it's up to about six atmospheres. A uh, champagne cork, when it comes off, can go across the room at about 90 miles an hour. Wow. So one of the things I had to learn to pass the certified sommelier exam was how to open yeah. Yeah. a bottle of sparkling wine safely. So the tea towel. one of the things you do that's really important like, let's say this is your bottle. You've taken the, the, the capsule off, the, fo the uh, foil on the outside, and then uh, typically a full-size bottle, not like this one, will have a wire cage on it called a mousselet. So you're going to unfold the cage. But what do you do while, as you're loosening that cage? You keep one hand on top of the bottle the whole oh. time because if you loosen the cage and the cork is... Oh, wow. Hmm? Lisa, you've muted yourself. You've muted yourself. No, Did anybody hear anything? We heard no. us do oh. what the, the cage was called, the mucilage. Oh, okay. <laughs> so once the cage comes off, you, you keep your hand on top. Don't point this at anybody that you like. <laughs> point it at anybody you don't like. You hold the bottle at a 45 degree angle and you point it away from people or valuable objects and you turn it and you ease the cork out, but you never take your hand off the top and you never, the most important thing is don't point at anyone. It's an automatic fail on the certified sommelier exam if you point your sparkling wine at somebody <laughs> while you're showing that you know how to open it like a professional. So you're ready for the test now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, how about if we move on to our next wine, which is also from the Veneto, from the northeastern part of Italy. And this is called Pirapan Suave Calvarino. The grapes here are, um, again, kind of unusual indigenous grapes. One of them is Garganega. And that's the majority, and it will be in, in any Suave, it will be at least 70%. Okay, with any of the and then it's blended with a grape called, in the Veneto, Treviano de Suave. But Treviano de Suave has, has an alter, is the alter ego of Vermentino. And that's one of the three big white grapes of Italy that start with V that are terrific and well worth drinking. So if you like this and you like its flavors, you probably like Vermentino. In any event, um, mm -hmm. what we know about this one is that it's made in the Classico region, which is the area where the grapes were originally grown. And that's you typically, if you see Classico in a bottle of Italian wine, you are enjoying wine from the original areas. The most, so Chianti Classico, for example, the heart of the zone, the area that has the best growing conditions for the grapes. And this particular one is made by a family who've been making wines for a long time. And they are really known for establishing the benchmark quality levels for Suave. And they also make the wines that most people think are among the very, very best. And they're incredibly reasonably priced. I don't know if any of you looked up the price. Um, uh, so, so any questions about Suave? It's delicious, thank you. Mm. <laughs> Lisa, you mentioned Classico, and you suggest that it was geographic. Is there a, is there a single? Is there a single area or is it many, many areas that have that classification? A lot of them do that. What happened is when an area became popular, let's say Chianti or Suave, then people would start expanding and they would, they would uh, authorize yeah. more regions, but they aren't necessarily as good. They could be, but they probably aren't because the ideal growing conditions, a lot of them are on the hillsides that we've talked about, for example. But the ideal growing conditions are usually in the Classico region. 
That doesn't mean there isn't a great producer throwing great grapes someplace else, but it, it's a good sort of a, a way to think of why, if you're looking at a, a list of like five Chiantis and you have a choice of a Chianti a Classico. Classico, you're probably better off with the Classico. Mm -hmm. Suave is very, the suave tastes, it's very smooth, like very drinkable, I would say. Yeah, it has a nice round fullness in your mouth. It's soft tasting in yeah. your mouth, isn't it? Yes, it, yeah. that's exactly right. That's it. As a non-white wine drinker, one, this is excellent, and two, it's just a beautiful color. It has a little gold to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's probably fabulous with your cheeses. Has anybody tried it with your cheese or your almonds yet? Yes, yes. Very the nice. Delicious. Two of the cheeses. Uh, now, one of the nice things about Suave, if you've looked at the notes, this wine goes with a lot of food. So it's hard to make a mistake when you pair it. Um, if you look at the electronic version of your handout, which came with your Zoom link, there's a link you can press on for a pesto recipe that doesn't use any cheese. It's five ingredients. Um, it, it's very quick to make. You can buy some basil grown in the grocery store and you don't, other things you probably have in your house. Um, and Don and I tried it with pasta with um, pesto that we made ourselves and we thought it was perfect with that because it has a little bit of a green flavor that I think blends with the basil. But it'd be great with fish, which we have plenty up here on Hilton Head too. Um, so it, does anybody think this tastes like Chardonnay or do you think it tastes different to Chardonnay? I think it's no different than Chardonnay. It's less sweet and less dry. And I really like that about it. it it's very different. It has a lot of lighter, body to it. Lighter flavor than a Chardonnay to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like a Spanish white, Lisa, like an Albarino kind of white. Yeah. So some of the Southern, Dawn and I think this is Southern European wines often taste kind of nutty. Um, instead of tasting a lot like fruit, they maybe they taste a little bit like herbs and like nuts. Um, and it's just a, compl and a little salty sometimes. So it's a very different taste profile. And those three V's I re mentioned, Vermentino, Verdicchio. Oh, I just drew a blank, Don, we'll fill you in the third one. Um, Vernaccia. The, those three will all taste, I, th I think this is lovely. At, and is a little different, but basically they'll have a similar flavor pro profile. They're great with a lot of foods and they're a nice change of pace. Mm -hmm. Cold as- Lisa. Oh, sorry. Four. I just wondered if it should be as cold as the Prosecco or, I mean, should it be as cold as-, as um, You probably don't want it as cold as the Prosecco, but you want it cool. Um, you can put it in your refrigerator for maybe two hours before you drink a bottle of this. And then it will warm up a little in your glass as you drink it, which will change it a little. But um, you don't want it, you don't want it refrigerator temperature when you drink it. Lisa, I've seen the uh, label La Marca in the stores, but uh -huh. what about trying to purchase this? Um, I think if you go to Rollers, you might have a chance, although maybe not. You know who I think has it? Over by um, Kroger, there's a, a, a smaller wine shop mm -hmm. in, in that same plaza. Mm -hmm. Kroger might have it also because they have a huge selection. I think we bought ours at the Shelter Cove wine shop. Oh. And I think Harris Teeter might carry it also. Um, but price-wise, Don, do you remember the Calvarino price? It's probably around $30 or so. So it's not really the same price level as you might see in the grocery store normally, right. unless they, right. like Kroger, right. they're having a really upgraded area. Okay. They do a great job. But these people also make a um, sort of lower level, much more cost-effective um, uh, Suave Classico. That's also very good and will remind you a lot of this. This is, this is the step up wine. Everything is a mm -hmm. little bit better. The color is a little bit deeper the the flavors are a little bit rounder but uh the suave classical if you like this you'll probably like that and that's more available and less expensive don we we've come to expect nothing less from you <laughs> so, so lisa 
They said, does Italy restrict their territories and license them like up in France, the Champagne region and Bordeaux region? You have to be part of the group to call the wine that? So this is a system that works all over Europe. David's talking about the Appalachian system where there are mm. controls that say, if you want to be able to stay Suave on your wine, you need to grow the wine in the designated Suave area with the grapes that are permitted according to the vine growing rules, like how many grape vines you could put in a hectare, for example, you probably have to follow winemaking rules. So it's very highly controlled. That's one of the things that's really different between the United States and the old world that while we have AVAs where you have to have the grape in Napa Valley to put Napa Valley on your wine. There are no rules about what grapes you can grow or how you grow them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's hopefully some guarantee that the style will be recognizable and the same. Um, there are other systems that are a step down from the Appalachian mm -hmm. Control A system where uh, p growers have a little more free freedom and they can maybe mm -hmm. have some more choice about the grapes they use. Um, but if you're looking for DOC in Italy or AOC in France, then there are a lot of rules that govern how those wines are made. I think I have a little, did, Cindy, didn't you just post on my website? Um, I have a new website, which I think we put on the, on the handout. And I think I have a brief discussion of how the Appalachian systems work in my blog. Uh, yes, that's correct. It is uh, on your blog. It's one of the more recent posts. And the website is findyourwinestyles.com for those of you wishing to pursue further wine excellence. I know it's that. Lisa. Oh, yes. What does Appalachian mean? I think it probably translates to name, like yeah. named, yeah. controlled name would probably be the restricted. I know appel is the French word for name. So it's, like, it's basically a named wine region. Should we try our red wine now? What do you think? I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> so now you have. I'm a red <laughs> guy. Red wine lovers. Here we have Tornadore, Etna Rosso. So this one is coming from a very hot area. People are very interested in wines from Sicily right now, especially from Mount Etna, which is. Um, a volcano, an active oh. volcano. So I guess these grape growers are very brave because they work on the side of those mountains even though they might erupt. Now, there's a really fun Princeton connection. If you have your hand out, do you see Indiana Tiger down there on the left side, the bottom left? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Princeton was instrumental yes. in starting a dig on the other side of Mount Etna from our vineyards um, in a place called Morgantina. It, it's an ancient site. Um, and um, Cindy actually had Professor Childs as her advisor, who was one of the first trench masters there when it opened in 1955. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't know if he had the hat. What do you think, Sin? Um, <laughs> well, he definitely had a pipe. I could always tell when he was in his office because he was always smoking, but every time I saw him, it was something different. That, that was truly impressive variety. Uh, so what we don't know is whether Professor Childs and all his Princeton colleagues went over to the other side of, of Mount Etna and bought some, some Etna Rosso, but we think it's highly likely that this is a wine that our Princeton colleagues were drinking while they were excavating this fascinating site. <laughs> It's delicious. Um, yeah. Mm. So this was a great discovery. I it's um it's not a heavy wine, but it, yeah. it has a lot of flavors yeah. and a lot of interesting texture um, and complexity. Uh, to me, it, it just has when I smell it, I think, oh, it smells so good, and I smell flowers and fruit and. Mm. <laughs> uh, and um, it, it's a little bit in weight. Thank you. It's maybe a little bit like a, a Pinot Noir might be, but it's yeah. a different, it's different kind of flavors. Yep. It doesn't yeah, have the so weight of say Bordeaux. Yep. So this is another wine from a family of artisans. They started growing grapes on Sicily in 1865. Mm. And they are making a variety <laughs> of, of wines. 
but we don and i actually tasted several of them and and this is not the most expensive one but we thought it was the most interesting in flavors and it's a great value this is another wine that's not expensive which you're going to find about a lot of the italian wines terrific values um, Lisa, you said you said that you discovered it. What's the story behind discovering that wine? Um, we just, you know, the way we discover most wines, we just keep tasting. Good few. But you got this. Did you get this locally? Um, yes, all of these, all the wines that you have. We've got the prosecco you can buy in the grocery store. It's very widely distributed, but yeah, the other really two. Nice all came from that Shelter Cove shop. But again, I think you could probably find them in Kroger and I'm pretty sure Harris Teeter has some of these, but if, if you want them for sure, you could call the Shelter Cove wine shop and they will order them for you if they don't have them in the shop already. Mm -hmm. And as I said, they're very reasonably priced for what they are. And are the people in the Shelter Cove wine shop knowledgeable? Well, we weren't, you know, I'm sure they are. We, we weren't really um, going there to look for wine knowledge. We were looking for particular wines. Well, I understand that. But could we rely on them for good information? Uh, I'm sure you could. You can also send Don and me questions anytime you want. Um, <laughs> we'd be happy to answer them. I even have a, a contact link on my blog. You can send an, a, a, on my website. You can send a question through that. So, so I also know that up in the Beaufort area, uh, Dick's Liquor is very, very good with their wine selection. And the one, at least the one that you me, the yeah. guy who runs it, is excellent at recommending wines. Um, so I don't know if, you, if there's a Dick's anywhere near any of you, but they have been absolutely excellent and just continuously recommending the wines to me. <laughs> I think there might be one in Bluffton. And also, we uh, buy a lot of wines with rollers which not only has some very knowledgeable, uh, you know, certified sommeliers working there, mm. uh, but the owner's daughter went to Princeton and is Ann Kelsey, oh. um, I don't know her, her now last name, but Ann Kelsey, uh, who is Reese's partner in, um, in the alumni interviews. Uh, mm. And so she was on our, our last tasting and uh, so mm -hmm. never hurts to keep it in the Princeton family. <laughs> Don, you're talking about the wine and cheese place uh, near Publix, not the one down in Caligny, right? No, Caligny. Oh, okay. oh, it's the one in, in near Publix that, that we go yeah. to. But, yeah, because the Caligny think, one doesn't have, doesn't have nearly as wide a selection as the one is that, oh, That's good to know. Right, yeah. It does but I, I've also the used the... To. I've also oh, used the... I've also used the uh, Shelter Cove store that uh, Lisa mentioned and found them quite knowledgeable and, and also always willing to order anything I want, but I imagine a minimum of a, of a case. Uh, David, we also, we're, David, we're hearing everything you say to Christy. David, we're hearing everything you say to Christy. You might want to mute. I have a question. And you might, Lisa, if you've already covered this, but tell me about swirling wine. How much should you swirl it? Do you swirl the white and the reds in general? Um, and if you already covered it, sorry, I've been in and out. Not at all, but we swirl everything, Margie, and I'll tell you why. First of all, let's, let's look at my little glass here. Can you guys see this glass? This is a small glass, but what matters, and Margie is the same thing. You want to capture the aromas, which is why you're gonna swirl. So you want a glass that's narrower at the top than the bottom. And when you swirl, when you swirl the wine glass and then you smell it, it should release some aromas for you. And people don't always tell you this, but like about 75% of what you taste is, is aroma. Mm -hmm. so, so when you smell the wine and you taste it, a lot of the, the taste sensation is actually coming from what you smell. So we always swirl our wine. I would say even repeatedly, we think, well, I'm not sure that I smell everything I want to smell and I would do it again. Um, and I, what do you think? What do you guys think? It, try swirling, then put your nose right down to the glass. Yeah, you can and smell And take the a deep taste. breath. Do you notice you smell it more than if you hadn't swirled it before? Mm-hmm. You can actually do it on the table. You don't have to worry about spilling if you're doing this in the air. 
put your glass on the table and just hold the stem and swirl it around that way. And that's a little safer way, Pro probably safer for me anyway. The rest of you are probably <laughs> great at swirling in the air. <laughs> okay. Depends on how much wine we've all had probably, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now another question with that, stem versus stemless glasses. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, here's the thing. If you look at the way I hold my glass, I'm trying to hold it right in front of the, the picture here, mm -hmm. but this, I put my fingers on the stem. Um, the nice thing about that is you don't transfer heat from your hand mm -hmm. to the glass. So I think that that's a real plus. I mean, it depends on how long you're going to be drinking it. If you're standing up at a party and you're gonna drink your wine pretty quickly, you, it won't make any difference where your hand is on the glass. Don and I actually had a discussion about this yesterday about how much heat is really transferred from your hand and does it matter? <laughs> uh, I think I'm in favor of the stem. Don may be more of an agnostic. What do you think, Don? My fingers are always cold, so I don't think I'm actually heating up the wine, uh, but uh, most people probably are. And if it's a really nice wine, it might make a difference. If you're sitting around the pool and having a glass of wine, you're probably less likely to knock over one if it doesn't have a stem. And that's, that's probably the, the better choice, even if it's a degree uh, warmer. Okay. Or even well better said. have a plastic glass when you're sitting by the pool. Lisa, I just but wanted normally, to pick up on a, a going off of Margie's question about swirling is I've also heard some, some sommeliers, they like to first take a sniff and then like, sort of take one sniff still and then swirl and sniff again because it releases more aromas. Is that... Um, is that really gonna change the effect? I'm, I'm just curious. Oh, well, you could do the experiment. I think it does make a big difference because when you swirl it, it releases more. One of the reasons they might if before they swirl is that it would be easier to smell flaws in the wine because there's less competition from any, any aromas that might still be present despite a flaw. Oh. So I actually often think you don't necessarily need to taste a wine to know it's flawed. You, you can smell things for example, if you have a wine that's had too much heat, it might smell a little burned or just won't smell like anything. Or a wine that's what we call corked, which means it has cork taint. Um, it kind of smells like a basement or old socks. So if you smell that, and you could swirl it and try to enjoy that experience more. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just um, call it a day on that wine. Okay. Uh, but it also, it's a fun experiment if you all do it, sniff it and then swirl it and see if you think there's a difference. Lisa, once I was traveling with a friend decades ago in Tulsa and he had been studying wines. He selected a wine, he tasted it and rejected it saying it had reverted to fusel oil. And was he anywhere close to being accurate in that? He happened to be a chemist. Um, was it a Riesling? Was it a white wine? Probably a Cabernet. Oh. Well, I don't know if that's a term I've heard, but over time, the wines degrade. Rieslings can sometimes take on an aroma of what we call petrol, which is not considered a flaw in them. That's why I asked if it was a Riesling. Um, Don's very sensitive to petrol. He'll pick it up before just about anybody, but it's not, it, most people think it adds something. Um, fusel oil doesn't sound very attractive though. Well, it could be. No. This is an oil town, so they may have liked it. But if a wine doesn't really doesn't smell good to you, there's probably something wrong with it. You don't have to name the flaw. Um, you can just say it's it's not acceptable. I thought he was showing off. Maybe there are people who send wines back for just that reason, give the poor sommeliers in the restaurant a hard time. But hopefully, most people are sincere when they say there's a problem with their wine because it's expensive for that restaurant or bar to open bottles of wine for people and not be able to serve them. How Lisa? often does that happen for you? Lisa? Oh, I just quick question, Susan. Uh, not all that often. I think that modern winemaking has made a big difference and we don't see flawed bottles very often. I'm sorry, Susan, go right ahead. When you, you have, have a crowd, crowd, will you tell us about your your course to become a sommelier. 
from beginning to end, what you went through, what you did, and how it came about. How much time do you have, Susan? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it all started, in, and actually, if you go to my website, there's a link to an a art, little article I wrote um, that appeared on the Jancis Robinson website. She's a well-known wine critic that said that I never thought I liked wine until I tasted a really good wine when I was in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I realized I, what, maybe I just wasn't drinking the right wine. So it was kind of a long journey. Um, Don bought me for Christmas one year a, a wine course, which I eventually got around to taking and I liked quite a bit. And I looked at the certified sommelier exam and realized I was probably pretty well prepared for it from the course I had taken. Um, so I, we flew to Atlanta and I took a two day course, which was called the introductory sommelier exam. At the end of the second day, they give you a test, but there's no tasting. It's just an, a, a knowledge test. Um, but because it was right around Easter, for some reason they had scheduled the certified sommelier exam the next day. And so I thought, well, we're here anyway. We paid all this money to go to Atlanta. We're in the hotel. We couldn't leave soon enough to get home that night because of the test being at the end of the day. So we stayed over and I took the next exam. And um, like we did before our, our WSET exam, we went to the local grocery store and bought a bunch of bottles of wine to, so I could practice serving and, and um, opening properly before the next day. So um so that's how I, I took the certified sommelier exam. I, was, I mainly studied through another course, which gave me the information and studied the internet a little bit because I didn't have anyone to coach me on how to do the tasting or the, um, the um, serving. But there is a lot of information available about how to do that. So we liked wine so much, we decided to do the Wine and Spirits Education Trust courses. Um, and I actually would highly recommend them they're designed for trade professionals. They do have tasting, but there's no service component. And it's a great way to get a really good overview of wine and feel like your knowledge has expanded and you can have a lot of confidence about recognizing wine regions and styles of wines. Um, I started with the level three exam because I'd done the certified sommelier, but Don started with level two and they do tasting all the way through. Now, we don't have a WSUT course offering here in Hilton Head. You can take one online. There's a place in Philadelphia that offers an online version. Um, and I think there's a school that started in Philadelphia, but Don and I did their highest level, which is the diploma. And that required us to take five exams. And believe me, we're a little old to be sitting and writing exams with like pens and pencils, uh, but we did it uh, over the course of a couple of years. And we had blind tasting on three different exams, which added up to a total of, I think, um, uh, maybe 16 wines we had to taste, something like that, 16, 18. So we, we had to do blind tasting and, and they do teach you some of it. Um, and it's, it's actually a very learnable skill. It's, you just have to practice and it's really helpful if someone tells you what you're looking for when you're doing the tasting, um, but you need to learn things like not only what does the wine smell like and taste like, but how much tannin does it have? How much acidity, how much alcohol? And you can really teach yourself to do all those things. So it was kind of a fun thing for us to do together. Don, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, yes, uh, in part, sometimes the Lisa's definition of fun and mine differed, but um, uh, Lisa has done a good job of describing it in a way that makes it sound uh, a whole lot less hard than it is. <laughs> um, a whole book was written by a Princeton alum about becoming a certified sommelier. It's called Cork Dork. And if you look on, it, it was very popular. It's, it's, it's lively and well-written and will um, we'll tell you a lot about the process and a lot about this young woman who, um, who went on from Princeton to, uh, to study to be a certified sommelier. It's, it's not, a, not for the faint of heart. Uh, then I, Don, next... I have to say, I, I think she makes it sound harder than it is. Well, certainly it, it's a little more dramatic if you make it, if you make it extra hard. Uh, I will say that we did this diploma. It took a couple of years uh, that 
we have PhDs from Princeton and we think the diploma was hard. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's not a trivial exercise, but kind of fun to do. Um, but they have, have other courses that are at a less challenging level for people who don't want to devote uh, as much time or as many three by five cards to wine as we did. And so you, if you're interested, it's kind of a hoot and you can do it over the internet. And I would recommend it because I've learned a lot. And now Lisa and I can talk about wine, which I couldn't do before. <laughs> Lisa, I have, a, I have a question. Okay, go for it. <laughs> the, um, my father used to like, we would swirl wine and he would judge whether it had legs. Can you talk about legs? Okay, let's talk about that. If everyone holds a glass up and turns it at about a, I don't know, 45 degree angle or so, can you see this? Now, mm -hmm. let it go back to horizontal. I don't actually see a lot of legs on this. See, no, if not on see, this one. see if you see anything dripping down the side. Maybe the Calvarino will, will be a little better. It has a lot of body. Um, so the Calvarino is a little better. I see a rim up here and then it will gradually start to dribble down the sides. Now, some people think that's a sign of quality and it can be. It's actually a sign of how much body the wine has. Yeah, and exactly. So for Disgusting. example, if, if you have a sweet wine and it has a lot of sugar, that gives the wine a lot, like a sauterne. The wine has a lot of body. So it will, it will be kind of viscous, relatively speaking, and it will dribble down slowly. Um, Another reason why it might take a little longer is that it has residual sugar, even if it's not a sweet wine. So the amount of body and the way the wine is made will have an effect on that. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the kind of wine it is, like if, if let's say we're back to the Sauternes, which is the delicious sweet wine from Bordeaux, then that's probably a really good sign <laughs> that it's got lots of legs and it's, it's that they've made it the way they should. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, when you guys were studying for the sommelier exam, <laughs> did you use did you use the like scent, scent kit. kit? The which kits? I'm sorry. It's like oh. a, a wine scent kit. Oh, like Linez Divan. Yeah. yeah. Um, we actually bought one of those, but we couldn't smell anything in it. Um, when we were working on the on the diploma on the fourth level, Don went to the grocery store and he came back with this massive collection of spices and different jars of things. Um, black currant is a flavor that that the Brits all and they they dominate because this, this course we took started there. They think they taste that in Cabernet. He ordered um, something called Rebola on the Internet, which is a drink they make in England that has a it's made from black currant juice. You won't see that in the U.S. because black currants were illegal in this country for a long time. I think they were believed to carry some kind of disease. So I think what makes the most sense is to smell actual items that you believe, like cloves or cinnamon or honey, um, the different fruits, you know, red fruit, white fruit, apples, melons, and that. And and even though the flavors and the aromas can be very subtle in a glass of wine. If you start doing that, you get a little more sensitized to what you think you might smell. Also, mm -hmm. you can pick up a glass of wine. You can, if you like it, you think you smell things in it, look online for reviews and you may see that the, um, the reviewers have listed aromas and flavors that they think are present. So that's a good way to calibrate whether you're finding the right things. Although they, there may be a lot of variety in what they say they find. Don, would you like to add anything to that? I think that's a really good summary. It really helped me because I didn't grow up cooking or particularly liking foods or, or actually thinking about smells and aromas at all. That actually having a plum or a, you know, a clove in front of me helped a lot in the learning process. Um, and much of the flavors that, that are kind of standard are set by people in England. And so you have to think about what they like, like Marmite or black currant. Uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, if you can, if you, if your nose is good enough to smell out of the, 
Lunez Devan, then that's great. If not, then uh, go to the grocery store and you know buy a little of everything. I will tell you, it is not. I had a friend who had one of those scent kits and we kind of made a game out of it. Like pick a random scent, see if you can guess it. All of us were horrible at it. So <laughs> maybe why a, just go to yeah. the grocery store. <laughs> There's a very famous taster. His name is Raj Parekh, who was a sommelier in San Francisco and now he's a winemaker. And he used to talk about just going through like the farmer's market and picking things up and smelling them. I mean, I hope he bought something if he was sniffing all the fruits, um, but I, that's the best way to train yourself. And don't expect it. I mean, in some cases, the flavors are very, very obvious, but after a while, if you keep practicing and you have it, you can look on for descriptions of what the wine should taste like. Um, with practice, they really do come right out. I think for me, a, an advantage of, was doing just what Lisa said. You have a glass of wine in front of you that every reviewer said smells like honey. Now I smell that it may not smell what I think honey, like what I think honey smells like, but I've now figured out that this is what wine people say honey smells like. <laughs> and so uh, it means that when I smell this smell, I write down honey, honey. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> whether it's really honey I can't say, but but I know other people will say it. And if I put it on an exam, they'll give me a point for it. You're such a skeptic. I, I am. <laughs> Thank you both very much for answering that. That was really informative. Hmm. Uh, Lisa, Don, um, when you're doing the tastings for your exam, 16 different wines, do you spit them out after each taste? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and when we took the, the biggest unit, which is worth half of the diploma, which is called it's unit three, and that you've tasted 12 wines in the morning and you wrote for four, four hours in the afternoon, the last thing you want to do is swallow the wine because you have to get through so much work later on. So you do learn to spit uh, when you're doing lots of tasting. I don't recommend you do that with a nice glass of wine you enjoy. <laughs> I'm not doing it tonight, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good sign. Very good sign. Lisa, can you talk about corks versus spoons? I've heard a lot of different points of view on that. That's a good question. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. Can I talk about what? Uh, corks versus spoon tops. Oh, sure. You know, it's really, I think it's a fascinating debate. I will tell you right up front that I love screw caps. Mm -hmm. um, that so I. I think they're so easy to open. You don't have to worry about a cork spoiling your wine. Um, ha having said that, there are some occasions in which um, the screw cap may not have a great effect on your wine. So for example, um, wine can be made in such a way it doesn't come in contact with much air and they do that deliberately to preserve the flavors but if you then put that bottle of wine in a screw cap it might taste a little what people call reduced which means it's got a little bit of a sulfur smell you can usually swirl the bottle and that will go away um, but generally speaking even though people say that fine wines are usually usually have a cork Every wine in Australia practically has a screw cap and there are a lot of really fine wines there. Um, the other thing that's happened is that there are now technologies to, to produce corks that are, are safer and not very likely to be contaminated. Diam makes corks from aggregates. So they, they manage to um, purify and sanitize the aggregate. If you look at your bottles of wine, sometimes you'll see the word D-I-A-M on it. And it'll look like a cork on the outside, but in fact, it's an amalgam. And depending on how long your bottle of wine is supposed to survive, it might say diam 5 or diam 10, for example. So it tells you that different corks are rated to, to last longer. Hmm. Oh, anything, Don, anything you want to add about corks? No, he says no. Okay. Nice. But I love screw caps. I, I think they're great for your wine. Mom, did you? Part of that, I heard that the, it's very difficult these days to find quote quality cork like they could in the old days. I don't know what that means. Right there. Well, 
here's the thing. We used to lose a lot more wine to cork taint, which is something called, uh, people call it TCA, that, that can be picked up in, in the field in the cork itself or in the winery. I think there is better technology for making sure that the corks are clean than there used to be. And the cork companies have put a lot of money into that because they're losing their shirts to Diam, who's getting cork aggregate, which is, means it's like small, less expensive bits of cork instead of a big sheet where you have to punch a whole cork out. So I, I think corks are safer than they used to be and cork taint has diminished considerably. Thanks. Oh, Don just pointed out, Tornatore is Diam, he opened it. So if you've got your Tornatore cork, your red wine cork, let's see if it says what year on it. It says Diam 5, and you'll notice we tell you in the handout that you'll probably ought to drink this within five years at the most. So is... it, it looks like a cork, although if you look at one end or the other end, you can see it has a little different consistency. It looks more like the inside of a piece of Ikea furniture. Okay, so that's a good, good example of a Diam cork. Um, Mom, I was just wondering if you could address the role that corks have in wines that are supposed to age in the bottle, because that's an area, aren't those the kinds of wines you wouldn't necessarily want a screw cap for, even though once you open them, maybe you would? Um, well, the Australians will give you a fabulous Shiraz that's supposed to age in the bottle or a Cabernet, and they'll have a screw cap on it. Having said that, some people believe that the minuscule amount of air, of oxygen that can go through the cork helps with the aging because part of what happens in aging is that all the flavors and the components of the wine interact a little bit with air and over time they improve if it's a wine like a great Bordeaux that's meant to age. Um, so I think some of these really great and very expensive wines are made in a way where they hope the cork is adding to the aging process and helping perfect the wine over time. But we've had some pretty wonderful um, Shiraz from Australia under screw cap that had aged for years. So I, I'm not sure where anybody's coming out in, final, in terms of final determination. Okay. Uh, Lisa, conversely, uh, can a hundred year old Bordeaux be good? There are people who drink those wines. Um, you can, Don and I actually went to a tasting in New York with old Riojas. And we tasted a Rioja from the 20s that actually tasted like it, it wasn't quite ready to drink yet. Wow. So there are wines, they have a lot of structure, they have a lot of concentrated flavors, they have tannins, they have good acid levels, and those wines um, can last for a very long time. I'm sure you could look online and find stories of people tasting Bordeaux from the, from the 1920s that they said were delicious, at least to them. But they won't taste like the wine that you bought that's ready to drink, say, five years after you buy it. They'll be very, they'll yeah. be evolved into a new set of flavors. It's one of the things about some of these, you know, kind of expensive wines that you can find on the Internet is some experts use on how long they last. And some people will say, well, this particular Bordeaux will be a 50 year wine. Uh, and that'll be different, as Lisa says, than in year five. Now, if you're tasting that 50-year wine at year 100, <laughs> I think that wine experts have a special term for that. You hold up your glass, you sniff it, you swirl it, you sip it, and you say, that's interesting. <laughs> but, but Lisa, do they have to be recorked every 25 years, 20 years? You know, I have certainly read about people who do that. We have some ports that are older than 25 years and we've had them and they've been okay. Um, but there's certainly a school of thought that says these wines should be recorked. One of the reasons you lay a bottle of wine on its side when you store it for aging is so that the cork stays damp because if the cork dries out, then it is going to let too much air in. Um, so I'm sure you're gonna find lots of these old wines with their original corks. But if it gets too damp, then the wine's a waste too, I mean. Well, no, I, I don't think so. I think that the idea of laying the bottle on its side is that you're preventing the air from getting, there's always a little bit of air in the top of a bottle of wine. 
-hmm. but when you lay it on its side, you're keeping that air away from the cork. And so you're, you're preventing it from drying out in a way that you wouldn't want it to. Mm -hmm. Also, you want to keep I it, if you want to keep, if you have a nice bottle you're trying to save, let, keep it on its side in the dark, away from light, and ideally at about 55 degrees. You, know, you can buy little little that. wine cooler units that will do those things for you. Um, for, for both Don and Lisa along those lines, as we were talking about aging and <clears throat> quartz, but you also brought up ports and between ports, Madeiras, et cetera, these more fortified wines that often are aged in the bottle. What's that relationship like? Because um, I, I know there are some ports and Madeiras that right you stick in the bottle and then and they, they stay there for a long time. But I think there was once a joke. This is something Don once told me that some wine reviewer once said that it was now time to drink your Madeira that was harvested in, I kid you not, 1869. So what's the, the okay. sort of the, the, the relationship there where, and, and especially the difference between say, I, I don't mean to call them table wines, but sort of wines that are just great versus the fortified wines. Okay. I'm gonna start with Madeira, but before I do that, I wanna make a point that I think I wrote into your handout. The vast majority of wines, more than 90% are made for immediate drinking. Most wines that you buy, you should drink them and enjoy them. Their flavors are fresh. They're not going mm -hmm. to improve with time. That's about 90% for immediate. And then you got maybe about another 5% that might be good for up to about five years, like this Tornatore or the Calvarino. That they have enough substance that they will improve and evolve in the bottle. The tiny, tiny percent of wines that can age, but probably less than 5%, need special handling that we've discussed. And everything I just told you about how to age a bottle of wine does not apply to Madeira. <laughs> Madeira. Madeira is a fortified wine. It's made on the island of Madeira, which is part of Portugal. And has anybody ever heard about the voyage around the world with the Madeiras? Anybody know much about Madeira? So Madeira as it evolves as a style because the sea captains would pick up wine in, in the island back in the 19th century, and they would go on long voyages and they would cross the equator and it would get very hot. And they found out that the wine cooked and all the flavors cooked out and it developed a kind of oxidative set of flavors, which would be things like coffee and chocolate, um, some nutty flavors, and, and also something called rancio, which some people really like, which is a little hard to describe. But they're developed a profile of the wine and it's basically an indestructible wine because it's had heat. It's had, now the way they make it, it's had heat, it's had lots of air. So what you have when you finish the Madeira production process is basically an indestructible wine. The only thing that could really harm that wine would be a tainted cork. So when you have a bottle of Madeira, you can generally wait a long time to drink it. You should actually store that upright if it has a cork in it because the last thing you wanted to do is touch the cork in case there's a flaw in the cork. Um, port's a little different. If you have a vintage port, that's the one that you should keep for time. Lay it on its side. Um, and if you have a tawny port, drink it when you buy it. Tawny port is the one that's aged in wood that tastes a lot like chocolate and coffee, all these wonderful flavors. It's fabulous with chocolate. Um, but if you go to the store and you buy yourself a bottle of tawny port, don't try to save it because it's meant to be drunk when it's released. Lisa, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to tell a story back in 1970, 1974 on Hilton Head, the Sea Pines Company was going bankrupt. And we as employees were given the opportunity to go to the wine cellars of the Sea Pines Resort restaurants and buy up wines. And Nancy has mentioned that her father liked wines, so he recommended a bunch of bottles that we bought. And he bought some too. Yeah, right. And um, I carefully stored them in our house closet for a couple of years until we moved to South Beach where we had built a house. And underneath the front porch, uh, outside in our temperate uh, climate, I stored the wines until we moved to Long Cove in 1989. 
one of our daughters was married in the early 2000s and we pulled out one of those. No, no, the, the uh, ones that, that we did, though, they have been stored. My father had kept the bottles that Dave's about to tell you about. They, he had kept them in his garage. They were also oh, okay. on Hilton Head. Basically the same. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, uh, at a very um, ceremonial uh, rehearsal dinner, we opened up these bottles of wine. I think they were early 60s. They were 66 red wine yeah which was our princeton graduation by happenstance but um unfortunately they didn't survive <laughs> oh, they were i'm so bucket. surprised by that <laughs> the wedding the one wedding was in 2002 and that was drinkable like we <laughs> served it to all the bridesmaids <laughs> and everybody but then the other wedding was in 2007 and it well, it, they were just undrinkable. <laughs> <laughs> I think we learned a lesson. <laughs> but my father had like six or eight bottles of the wine left when he died. And so we decided that he had several granddaughters and that at each of their weddings, there would be served a, one of the bottles. And so, <laughs> but it was awful. <laughs> Well, you could save the label. The label was very special. Right. Yeah. right here. <laughs> so Lisa, I actually do have a question about a sparkling wine made here in the US up in Michigan. I'm wondering if you've ever tried El Mabi. Oh, we have not. Have you tasted it? We had, Jerome and I were married in um, Northern Michigan and one of my friends is from Michigan and recommended this to us. And this was the sparkling wine that we had at our wedding. It is excellent. And I would love to know what you think about it if you try it. <laughs> what are the grapes in it? Who knows? I know. <laughs> uh, cuvee, does that help? It's a cuvee. Um, we'll, we'll we'll look it up. Um, yeah. You know, we had we went to um, give a talk up in the Bluffton area, and someone who was there, I think he was from Michigan, wasn't he? Donnie had a bottle of Cabernet Franc to to share with everyone. It was the best Cabernet Franc we ever tasted. It was so really? delicious. Um, Cabernet Franc doesn't necessarily get as ripe as it needs to in Bordeaux. I mean, one of the the dirty secrets of Europe is that they don't always have perfect conditions for ripening grapes, which is why. Vintage is so important there. Whereas mm -hmm. in the United States, we have a little more consistent weather and, and climate. So we have a better chance of, of having more reliable wines. But we will, if you could shoot me an email, um, we'll look for that. I can't wait to find that. Climate change is going to help Michigan wines in a big way. <laughs> and it's helping Bordeaux, actually. They're getting great vintage after great vintage without having to worry about years that are too cold for the grapes to ripen. Okay. Do we have any other questions or anything else that anybody would like to talk about? We've had a wonderful session, but some of you might want your dinner. I'm not sure cheese and, and almonds are enough. <laughs> One more, Lisa. What is, what is this? Can you see it? Yeah, Bouvre from a, a well-known producer. Bouvre is Chinon Blanc. Uh, excuse me, is Chinon Blanc. And that is another great white grape that people don't know about very much. It can be made in all styles from, from dry to sweet, still or sparkling. Uh, it has high acidity. It makes a terrific sparkling wine because it has high acidity and relatively neutral flavors. But if you keep a bottle of Bouvre for a while, it will develop these wonderful flavors of honey and lots of just wonderful, smooth complexity. It, Chenin Blanc is one of Don's favorite grapes, isn't it, Don? Absolutely. But with Vouvray, yeah. you have to wait a little while. If you see, a, it, that's from the Loire, that's a very, very cold region yeah. um, in the more Northern parts of France. Um, but so you don't necessarily want to drink it the year it's released. You want to hold on to it for a little bit. It's 2019, which tastes pretty good. Okay, well, that's good. Well, Barton and Get, I think they're a big producer. I think they make a lot of wine. And so they may be giving you wine that's just right for you right now. We discovered them uh, two, about two years ago. Really liked them. They were, it was selling for $8 a bottle at Harris Teeter. And we started to buy pretty large quantities. And Harris <laughs> Teeter doubled the price. 
<laughs> well, that's because you bought too much wine, Terry. You needed to go to more than one store. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not, you can't find it on the island now. You had to buy it online. Anyway, just well, thanks. I think I found Mowbray Wines, if that's the right name, on the internet. Uh, and they they list titles of their wines, sparkling wines, as us, sex, green, <laughs> red, and Detroit. Which one did you celebrate your marriage with? <laughs> uh oh, t trick question. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's from the Detroit area, so we could probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting combination of Riesling. Cayuga, and Muscat. Holy mackerel. Oh, wow. So I'll tell you what they're doing. They are, they are growing grapes that can tolerate really cold weather. That's one of the things that Riesling is terrific for. Riesling can actually freeze right down to the ground and grow again. And wow. Tramonet, I think, is a hybrid. And they, those are bred for uh, the cold weather. Yes. It was cold. We got married on March 31st, 2018, and it was 15 degrees and snowing. Oh <laughs> well, if that's what you wanted, it sounds great. It's, uh, it's, it's how I know he loves me because he agreed to be married in Michigan in the winter. <laughs> that's great. At least, uh... Lisa, Cindy, and Don, I, I think tonight is another illustration as to why the Princeton Club of Hilton Head is the only club that won both the best and the most innovative. You guys are fabulous. Oh, thank you. I, here, 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 here. I would, I would agree with that. All right. all right. Thank you all again, and hopefully we'll be together soon. I, I thank you so one much, more Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. 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 Thank you, Lisa.